good evening. It is good to be here with you this evening. And uh, I bring you greetings from the African Christian University in Lusaka, Zambia, and from the rest of the Bakum clan that's there. We have our seven youngest children living with us in Lusaka and our two oldest children living here. So I, my wife and I have yet to meet our grandson. Um, so we get to meet him Sunday, Sunday night um, for, the, for the first time. Uh, we were able to uh, sort of peer into the whole process as we were eye chatting with my daughter while she was in labor. And uh, it, it, was, uh, it was great. It was great to be able to be there and not have all the tension of being in the room. <laughs> it would turn it off when we needed to. It was just great. Um, there we go. Um, my family and I moved to, uh, to Zambia back in August of last year, so it's almost a year uh, that, we've, that we've been there. And um, I do have the privilege of serving as the Dean of Theological Education at African Christian University, and, uh, which is a new university there in Lusaka, and also the Dean of the Seminary, um, which um, should be starting uh, early next year. So please uh, pray for us. Um, we've committed to being there for three to five years, um, and then we'll see what happens uh, beyond that. Um, but please keep us in your prayers. Um, also pray for our children uh, that are back home. Um, we have a dear family friend who has come to spend time with us there in Zambia, and she's there with them right now. Um, we've been away from our children before, but not this far. Um, so it's an interesting time for us. Uh, also, please pray for this this tour. This is the first stop. I come back to the U.S. three times a year. I do generally do four two-week tours each year now, three of them in the U.S. and one in another part of the world. And um, so uh, this is the last time that I'll be in the U.S. this year. And um, so I'll be preaching here in New Jersey. And uh, then I'll also be preaching in Kentucky and in Texas and in somewhere else in the U.S. and then uh, in Alberta, Canada, and then we finish up in, uh, in Ireland uh, before heading back. So uh, pray for us as we're on this tour. My wife, of course, will be in Minneapolis with the grandbaby while I go in and out doing all this stuff. So um, tonight, our topic is the culture war. What we're going to do in this session, and probably really the first two sessions, um, both of tonight's sessions, is look at this issue of uh, cultural apologetics, things that are happening in our culture and how we look at them from a biblical perspective, how we understand them from a biblical perspective. Um, there are a lot of things going on in our culture, um, and for many Christians, we don't really understand those things that are going on. For the overwhelming majority of us, we don't understand where they've come from. And what I want to help us to do tonight is to understand these things from their root. Um, you know, if you, if you just go attacking bad fruit, uh, but you don't deal with the roots, bad fruit continues to grow back. Amen? Um, so we want to understand the root of these cultural issues. And um, so in that regard, what we're going to do is we're going to look at where what I think is the epicenter of this cultural warfare that we're experiencing, and um, that is the family. Um, so bear with me while we do that. Oftentimes as we talk about the culture, the culture war, um, people say, you know, we just need to get back to the good old days. Anybody ever heard that? We just need to get back to the good old days when we didn't have all these issues and all these problems. And I just like to ask people, um, 
how far back do we need to go? <laughs> and and the, the general consensus is that the wheels fell off in the 60s. And so we need to go back to the 50s. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> if you say so. Like, what? Don't, don't you agree? I mean, it was a different time back then. Well, yeah, 1950 was a different time than today. Yeah, but today we got all this stuff going on, and we're fighting wars all over the place, and, you know, we've got this, and we've got that. And I'm like, well, the Korean War actually started in 1950. So the 50s weren't a time without war. Well, you know, it was just a better time. Oh, really? Because, you know, not for people who look like me. <laughs> well, no, we go back to the 1950s without all the racism. Without all the racism, it wasn't the 50s. <laughs> 1951, South Africans had to begin to carry ID cards identifying their race as apartheid began in the 50s. 1952, 57,000 people crippled by polio, several thousand dead. 1953, Playboy magazine was first published. Many people think Playboy magazine is a product of the 60s. It was not. It was a forerunner of the 60s. It was first published in 1953. 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, which led to the Little Rock Nine. You remember the Little Rock Nine, right? Nine little black kids trying to go to an all white school in Little Rock, Arkansas, and the National Guard had to escort them in. Wonderful time in the 50s, right? 1955, Allen Ginsberg's poem, Howl, was published. Why is that significant? Because Howl was a poem. That was about lewd, lascivious homosexual acts. In 1955, 1956, Elvis scandalized America on the Ed Sullivan Show. You think all these problems with kids and their music is new? It's not. 1957, it was a film called Gypsy. It was a stripper bio turned into a movie. 1958, there was a movie called Lolita, which celebrated pedophilia. 1959, Castro took power in Cuba. You sure you want to go back to the 50s? See, it's interesting, interesting how we romanticize different periods of time. But if we don't go back to the 50s, where do we need to go to? If not the 1950s, how about the 1850s? I'm certainly not going back there with you. <laughs> the 1750s? The 1650s? Some other era? See, the problem is, whatever era you choose, sin is going to be there waiting for you. The second problem is that longing for a time that is not yours. Is actually sinful because you're being discontent with where the Lord has placed you. And you somehow believe that He used to be better than He is now. You ever thought about that? I want to go back to where God was doing a good job. He ain't doing so good right now. Yeah, you tell Him that. Ultimately, the problem is an over realized eschatology. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> the eschaton, or the age to come, is the, aged, is the age that is promised to us as God's people. The age when He will wipe away every tear from every eye. The age where all sin will be dealt with and done away with. The age where we will usher in. Ultimate and final reality and consummation of God's kingdom. But you see, that happens in the eschaton. That happens in the age to come. 
if we're longing for it in the here and the now, then we're not properly understanding the way that God has set up history. And hence we have an over-realized, excuse me, eschatology. The other problem is, unless whatever period you're yearning for is before the fall, then you got problems. Because the culture war didn't start in the 1960s or the 1860s or the 1760s or the 1660s. The culture war began in the garden. So unless you go back to Genesis 2, you haven't gone back far enough. The fact of the matter is the eschaton will be a revitalization a revival, a return, a restoration to what we had before the fall. And if you want to see the epicenter of all of these things, both then and now, you go to the heart of it and the family. Listen to this from Andreas Kostenberger. Measured against the biblical teaching on marriage and the family, it seems undeniable that Western culture is decaying. Um, I think Kostenberger's right. However, I now live outside of Western culture, and it's decaying there too. In fact, the past few decades have witnessed nothing less than a major paradigm shift with regard to marriage and the family. The West's Judeo-Christian heritage and foundation have largely been supplanted by a liberation ideology that elevates human freedom and self-determination as the supreme principle for human relationships. In their confusion, many hail the decline of the biblical traditional model of marriage in the family and its replacement by new competing moralities as major progress. Think about that. He says that there are people who look at the decline of the family and see it as progress. Is that hyperbole? I mean, certainly he doesn't mean that literally, right? Certainly there are people out there who are actually celebrating the demise of the family. Are they? Ari Hoichman. He's the head of the UN Population Fund, which is ironic if you know anything about the UN. Another thing I've learned a lot more about, living where we live. It's interesting. The UN is housed in the United States, but their influence is powerful elsewhere. I live in the midst of a country and in the midst of a continent now that is overwhelmed by the power of the United Nations and their power of the purse. I live in the midst of a continent where the UN is wielding their power, for example, by bribing African leaders of African countries that have laws against homosexuality by saying to them, you remember that debt that we said we were going to wipe out? If you don't change your laws about homosexuality, we're not going to wipe out your debt. That's the United Nations. Hoekman denounced the idea that high rates of divorce and out of wedlock birth represent a social crisis, claiming instead that they represent the triumph of human rights against patriarchy. Let me translate that for you. Better to have children growing up in families riddled with divorce or being born out of wedlock than to have them born in a culture that takes pride in fathers being the head of their household. But that's just one guy at the UN, right? Linda Gordon. If you know anything about the feminist movement, you know Linda Gordon's name. One of the most ironic lies in the whole world is the lie that feminism is based on a vacuum. 
those people who say, yeah, you know, feminism, <laughs> that's just there because men weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing and leading the way that they were supposed to be leading. If men were doing what they were supposed to be doing and leading the way that they were supposed to be leading, feminism wouldn't even exist. Listen to Linda Gordon. The nuclear family must be destroyed. By the way, this is in the 1960s. The nuclear family must be destroyed. And people must find better ways of living together. Whatever its ultimate meaning, the breakup of families now is an objectively revolutionary process. No woman should have to deny herself any opportunities because of her special responsibilities to her children. Let me read that for you again. No woman should have to deny herself any opportunities because of her special responsibilities to her children. Do you realize how ridiculous that is? You bring a child into the world, you have new responsibilities. You don't get to do whatever you want to do. Here's a news flash. Women aren't the only ones who don't get to do whatever they want to do when they bring children into the world. Amen, somebody. It's a whole new ball game. I mean, how many times you have to talk to young men? They got their head hung down. Why? Because I don't want to do this and that and the other, but I can't. Why? Well, you know, we got these kids now. That's right. You got kids now. (laughs) She continues. Families will be finally destroyed only when a revolutionary social and economic organization permits people's needs for love and security to be met in ways that do not impose divisions of labor or any external roles at all. That's feminism. Well, that's just Linda Gordon. Well, listen to the Declaration of Feminism from November 1974. Some of y'all didn't even know there was a declaration of feminism, right? It was 1974. This, this, this is the declaration of the ideology of the movement. Marriage has existed for the benefit of men and has been a, a legally sanctioned method of control over women. We must work to destroy it. The end of the institution of marriage is a necessary condition for the liberation of women. Therefore, it is important for us to encourage women to leave their husbands and not live individually with men. That's feminism. It was not because of a vacuum. It was not because men weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. Actually, the opposite of that is true. It was a direct confrontation of men doing what they were supposed to be doing and an outright rejection of men doing what they were supposed to be doing. So please stop telling that lie. Feminism does not exist because there is a vacuum. There is a vacuum because feminism exists. Listen to Wendy McElroy. In her piece, Marriage and the Family, an Ideological Battleground. Although the gender feminist view of marriage borders on the absurd, for example, housework as surplus value, it is key to understanding the depth of hatred they aim at heterosexual sex and men. This, in turn, is key to understanding the emotions that fuel sexual correctness. To the sexually correct feminist, marriage oppresses women. And the family breeds patriarchy. There's that word again, patriarchy. Male headship. Happily married women are considered pathological and traitorous. Well, that's just in radical feminist circles, right? No. That's in the church, y'all. No, it's not in the church. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You can do an experiment. Okay? Here's what I want you to do. If you don't have a teenage girl, borrow one. And then you have a luncheon. You have a luncheon with a bunch of church women. And you bring the teenage girl to the luncheon with the church women. And you, you get the teenage girl before she walks into the luncheon with the church ladies. And you say to her, listen, we're about to go into the room with a bunch of church ladies. You're going to be the only teenage girl in the room. They're going to ask you what you want to do and what you want to be. Here's what I want you to tell them. I want to be a wife and a mother. And you just keep telling them that. Don't say anything else. 
and you walk into the luncheon with the church ladies and watch them greet the young lady be kind and warm and welcoming to her and ask her what she's doing with her life and ask her what she wants to be and where she wants to go. And you let her look him in the eye and say, I want to be a wife and a mother and watch how they press her. Yeah, that's good, baby. But what else you want to do? What do you want to do for you? Yeah, that's good, but I mean, you know, do you have any career goals and ambitions and this? I just want to be a wife and a mother and watch the fangs come out of the church ladies. <laughs> Not talking about university professors. I'm talking about Sunday school teachers who are fire-breathing feminists who agree with the statement. McElroy makes. Betty Friedan. You remember her book, The Feminine Mystique from the 1960s, this kind of clarion call for feminism. In her book, Friedan called the family a comfortable concentration camp. Her goal was not to eliminate marriage at the time. That developed later. She merely wanted women to insist on more from life for them to reach outside of marriage for fulfillment. Now, I I think that's absolutely right. You must reach outside. If you cannot find your fulfillment in marriage, but what I mean by that and what she means by that are two different things. What I mean by that is your fulfillment is found in Christ and in Christ alone. It's not what she means by that. Listen to this from Stephen Baskerville. He studied these issues for a long time. He writes, the sexualization of politics and the politicization of sex is the most important and least scrutinized political development since the 1960s. In 40 years, the political left has transformed itself from a socialistic campaign against property and enterprise into a sexual attack on the family, marriage, and masculinity. Quick. Think of a major issue today. Think of a major hot button issue today. Think of a major cultural issue today. I guarantee you, as you think about that list, the majority of the things that come to your mind are rooted and grounded in the sexualization of politics and the politicization of sex. Think about the issues on our college campuses today. Think about the issues in the election. Think about those issues. And the vast majority of those issues are centered right here. The cultural battleground of our day is marriage and the family. So here's the question. What happened to marriage? And how did this happen? And what is this thinking rooted and grounded in? If you ask that question, you've got to go back before the fall. Genesis chapter 2. So let's look there, shall we, this evening. Genesis chapter 2. Beginning at verse 18. Then the Lord said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Now, this is important. We've got to put a pin here for a moment. This is important for two reasons. This is important. This is an apologetic issue, and this is also a theological issue. Let me deal with the apologetic issue first. And the apologetic issue, it comes up. You deal with this, 
on a college campus, and I, I love, I had the privilege of speaking on college campuses uh, quite frequently before we moved, and I love to talk about Genesis on college campuses for a number of reasons, not the least of which all the major cultural issues of our day, you can find them right there, especially in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Um, but secondly, because you start talking about Genesis and immediately, not immediately, even sooner than that, immediately, okay, <laughs> immediately, people's minds start racing. And they're like, wait a minute, this guy sounds like one of those people. And they'll ask me too. They're like, you know, I was just wondering, you were talking about Genesis and, you know, are you, are you, are you, are you trying to say that you're, you're one of, one of what are those people? Are you? Are you? What? what, 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 what are you talking about? Why do you say those people? What, are you, what, are you, what people are you talking about? Well, you know, you believe that God created the world and you know, in a week and you know, this and the other. I'm like, no, man, come on, what's wrong with you? He did it in six days. <laughs> Took the last day off. Really? You uh, so wait? Are you okay? So you're like one of these people. Who Earth is not that old, and you know, even though we know scientifically that it's. Been, oh, wait a minute! Hold on! Time out! Time out! Because nobody knows how old the Earth is. Y'all don't know. But here's what I don't understand: there are people, for example, that believe that the Earth is around 13 billion years old. There are other people who believe that the earth is somewhere around 10 billion years old. Others who will give you around 6 billion years old. You don't tell the 13 billion year people and the 6 billion year people that one of them is intelligent and the other one is not, right? There's 7 billion years between them and you think that they're both intelligent. There are fewer years between me and the 6 billion year person than there is between the 13 billion year person and the 6 billion year person. You'll give them 7 billion years and say they're intelligent. You won't give me 6. What's up with that? (laughs) Right? Because one of them is off by at least 7 billion years. Because that's not a scientific issue. It's a philosophical issue. The idea that the earth is that old is riddled with complications and questions that people who hold to that position simply cannot answer. Like, how do we have blue giant stars if the earth is that old, if the universe is that old? Because those stars don't last billions of years. They can only last thousands of years. How are they in existence in the universe? How do we have a spiral universe or, or a spiral galaxy? Spiral galaxies do not spin consistently on the inside of the galaxy and on the arms of the galaxy. How do you have spiral galaxies that still look like spirals after billions of years? That's not possible. It's not possible. Now, I know you've got ways that you explain that. They don't make sense. But here's my point. You say that there are difficulties with my position and some of the things that you've observed. I'm saying there are difficulties with your position and some of the things that you've observed. Your problem is not with difficulties in observation. Your problem is a philosophical one. Your problem is that if I'm right, there is a God. And if I'm right, the Bible is his word. That's your problem. Well, then they quickly want to go, well, well, you know, you say all that, but, you know, you you say you believe in the six literal days of creation. But what I want to know is this. You believe that Adam was created, literally, and that in one 24-hour day, he named all the animals, had major surgery, and planned a wedding. Yep. 
one literal 24-hour day. How is that possible? Three things. Number one, Adam did not name every genus and species of animal. That's clear from the record in Genesis. Number two, there would only have been a representative sampling of species at that time. By the way, this is also the answer to the other question that people ask about Noah and how he got all the animals on the ark. You don't need to get all the animals that we know on the ark. You don't. For example, you don't need to get the fox and the wolf and the German shepherd and the poodle on the ark. First of all, there definitely would not have been poodles. <laughs> and Adam certainly didn't name poodles because they would have come after the fall. In fact, they are evidence of the fall. All Noah would have needed is two representative dogs with all of the genetic characteristics of the various kinds of dogs that we now know. And from two representative dogs, you could have gotten every species of dog. Adam wouldn't have named all those different kinds of dogs. Cats, you don't need the lion and the tiger and the house cat. Again, no house cats before the fall. <laughs> Sin did that. You just need two representative cats from which you could get all the different kinds of cats that we now know. By the way, the same thing is true about ethnicities. Even secular scientists agree that all human beings have a common set of ancestors. That lived, and this is not me, this is, these are geneticists, that lived somewhere between five and 10,000 years ago. All of us, every last one of us, can be traced back to the same ancestors. So on the ark, you don't have to have all these different kinds of people. You just have to have Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And from them, you get all of the various kinds of people that you find here today. I love to tell that to young people. And they go, really? Even all the different colors of people? And then this really messes them up. You know, actually, people only come in one color. And they look at me, and they look at them, and they look at me. <laughs> and they're like, okay. I used to think you were smart, but now I see you're not. Because there are people of a lot of different colors in this room. Actually, no, there aren't. There's only one color of people, and that color is called melanin. Some have more melanin, and some have less melanin. But it's the same color. It's just a lighter shade or a darker shade based upon how much of it you have. Why? Because we all came from the same two people. Made from the same dirt. We're all the same color and we're all the same kind. There are not multiple races of people. If there were, we would not be able to reproduce with one another. Everything reproduces after its own kind. People only come in one kind. That's why racism is stupid. Because there is only one race of human beings. There always has been one race of human beings. Now, if you want to get spiritual and you want to talk about us spiritually, then you, yes, there are two races of people. The race of the first Adam and the race of the last Adam. That's talking about us spiritually. Biologically, there is only one race of people. We have multiple ethnicities by God's grace and for God's glory. 
but we're all the same race. Why is that important? That's important because this is why Adam could name all the animals in a single day. He only named categories of animals. And there would only have been a representative sampling of the animals that we now know. Just like there was only a representative sampling of all of the ethnicities that we now see. Then there's the theological issue. Why does Adam need to name the animals? Well, number one, Adam has no concept of alone. Think about that for a minute. There'd have been a lot of words that he wouldn't have known. There'd have been a lot of words that he wouldn't even have been able to make up. He's the creator of language, right? Human language. One of the words that he probably just wouldn't even have had a need for was alone. Till God tells him to name the animals. And when he names the animals, he recognizes. It's a he cat and a she cat. Dogs right there. So he dog and she dog. <laughs> cattle, land animals over there. Those birds. Those birds right there. Adam, what's the matter? I'm just thinking of a new word. <laughs> what's the new word, Adam? Alone. (laughs) He would have had no concept of need. He didn't know that he needed Eve until he named the animals. Thus God demonstrates through the naming of the animals and what happens after that marriage is his idea, not man's, which means it can only be defined by him not man. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the veal, but for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. The rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he fashioned into a woman. You know, there's different words used for the way God made Adam and the way God made Eve. Different Hebrew words used. One's really simple. It's what he did with Adam. He just made him out of the dirt. It's a dude right there, man. That's a. But Eve, he fashioned. and brought her to the man and the man said "Mm, mm, mm." (laughs) it's about the best translation I can give you (laughs) this is at last isn't this interesting this is at last at last means after something else right this is at last How, how do I know that his understanding of marriage is related to his naming of the animals. Because when the woman shows up, he says, now, at last, at last, after what? After all the other stuff I named. That stuff, not like this stuff. That's different. This, this, this right here, this is different. She not like them. She different. This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called in Hebrew Isha because she was taken out of Ish. She's one of me. Those are not. Man's not just another one of the animals. We're different. We're set apart. We're the crowning glory of the creation of God. Amen? We're set apart. Here's what's interesting. One of the issues surrounding our culture right now, one of the great culture wars right now, is this battle over man and his place in nature. Interestingly enough, if you're on a college campus today, you're being taught that man is an intruder in nature. 
that nature is nature and that man messes up the natureness of nature. You've been taught that. You probably believe it. Pave paradise and put up a parking lot. You see, before it was a parking lot, it was nature. But now it's no longer natural because man is not natural. Only Darwinian evolution gives you that. The idea that the world is somehow better off without nature. Listen to me, people. Plants grow better with us than without us. We cultivate them. You want to know what nature is like without us? Come with me on a safari. And on a good day, you might see what I saw one day. Nature. I'm talking real nature. Two lionesses killed a cape buffalo. Took him down. You can be as peaceful as you want. Trust me, if you ever see that, you will watch it. And as you watch it, here's what you will learn. Nature is brutal without us. Man can be brutal, but we don't have to be. Lions do. They can't not be brutal. We cannot be brutal. We do not destroy nature. We bring order to nature. We bring beauty to nature. We enhance the natural beauty that God has created in nature because we are made in his image and we are continuing to do what God did in creation. It's beautiful. Nature can't build the monuments that we build. Nature can't build the roads that we build in order to connect the world. Nature can't master the seas and the skies like we can. Nature can't tame those brutal animals and make them partners. We can do that. We tame brutal animals and exercise dominion and make them our partners in enhancing the beauty of nature. This is what human beings do. But if you're on a college campus today, we get in the way. Because overgrown weeds and animals that hunt to extinction are superior to us. The whole idea of conservation. Animals don't do that. We do that. And then we get on our moral high horse because of our Darwinian evolutionary worldview and we mess stuff up. For example, I live in Zambia, just north of Zimbabwe. Everybody heard about Clyde, the lion down in Zimbabwe, and that mean Dennis who killed that lion, right? Going down there, hunting lions and stuff. That's just terrible. That lion ain't never done nothing. Nobody went down there and killed that lion. That was bad. He deserved to be strung up for killing that lion. Here's what you don't know. Because of the way that they went after that doctor whose papers were in order and who broke zero laws in Zimbabwe. Because of what they did to that man in destroying his career and his reputation. Down in that game park in Zimbabwe, they now have too many lions. Because hunters stopped coming. Hunters, by the way, who paid between twenty and fifty thousand dollars to hunt a lion, which was an important part of the Zimbabwean economy. Not only have they now lost that money, but the number of gazelles and the number of zebras and the number of giraffes is low now because the lions are out of control and they're going to have to kill two hundred of them in order to get balance back to that park. Because lions don't conserve. They just eat. Humans are the ones who conserve. Do you hear what I'm saying to you folks? The tree huggers are wrong. (laughs) 
They're not the ones who love the world. If they had it their way, there would be chaos. Everything would be overgrown and out of control and things would hunt one another into extinction if they had it their way. And we're so turned upside down that we actually think that they're the ones who really love the world. Just stop shaving your underarms for a while, stop wearing deodorant, and all of a sudden, you're an expert on nature. (laughs) Don't even get me started. All right. We're going to learn how to think this weekend, right? Right? We're going to learn how to think. We're going to learn how to look at all those things out there and learn how to analyze them from a biblical perspective, right? All right. Here's another thing. God established marriage in the family here in Genesis 2. God designed marriage. God made marriage possible. God set the parameters for marriage. And God organized the family. God did all of that. God gave marriage its purposes. Three main purposes that we see for marriage. Number one, procreation. Procreation. Interestingly enough, there's a lot of things that Adam could have and would have done without Eve. There's one that we know would never have happened. Procreation. Amen, somebody. (laughs) There would not have been people. All right? So procreation. That's the primary purpose of marriage. Number two, illustration. Number three, sanctification. What do we mean by procreation? Um, God's first command to man is be fruitful and multiply. It's his first command in Genesis 1.28. There are a lot of other commands that came after, but number one was be fruitful and multiply. Um, by the way, that command, it wasn't a command, you know, like, like, like the Ten Commandments, you know, you shall not do this, you shall not do this, you know, where, where he's where he putting a check on man's sin. Um, th- th- this, this command was more like the command, you know, gentlemen, start your engines. Um, people are sitting in their cars going, oh, man, do I have to? Oh, they're waiting for that one, right? That's the kind of command that this is in the way it's phrased in the Hebrew language. Be fruitful and multiply. Do what you're created to do. What the desires that I've given you point you toward. It also involves bearing and training children. How do I know this? Because that comes in the dominion mandate. He tells them to take dominion over the birds of the air and the animals of the field and the fish of the sea. Um, If you're going to be fruitful and multiply with a view toward taking dominion, that means that you're going to have to raise children to whom you teach the dominion mandate. Okay? So procreation here, it's assumed involves the training of the next generation to be obedient to God. And thirdly, it spreads the image of God throughout the earth. That's what procreation is about. Secondly, illustration. What are you illustrating? Um, It's a physical model of a spiritual relationship. It's a physical model of a spiritual relationship. There's a second point of illustration here. It's interesting that When God says it's not good for the man to be alone, that's the first time he says something is not good. Now, why is that significant? Well, if you're a careful reader of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, there's a pattern that repeats itself. Let there be, then there was, it was good. Let there be, then there was, it was good. Let there be, then there was, it was good. Let there be, then there was, it was good. Let there be, then there was, it was good. Let there be, then there was, it was very good, right? So that pattern repeats itself over and over again. It's poetic. And then all of a sudden, after that poetic pattern, let there be, then there was, it was good. You get to chapter two, and all of a sudden, for the first time, God says something's not good. If it was an email, that would be bold, italicized, underlined, and in a different color. It screams. However, that's not a moral statement. He's not saying that man's done something wrong. It's not good for the man to be alone. It's not a moral statement because man didn't make himself alone, right? God made him alone. So we're not, we know he's not saying that it was sinful. We also know that not every person is going to marry. 
We know from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, um, you know, we know from Matthew 5, Matthew 19, that there are some people who are given this supernatural spiritual gift of singleness. I, I don't have that. I didn't have that at all. It's not a gift of mine. I met Bridget January 21st, 1989. We got married June 30th, 1989. Because we had to wait till summer vacation. Because that was my sophomore year in college. I met her at a dance. I walked up to her and I asked her to dance. She said no. <laughs> Six months later, we were married. Because I was what you'd call persistent. <laughs> Ten months after that, we had our first child. Because we were what you call efficient. <laughs> but there are people who had that spiritual gift, right? Singleness. So, why, what does he mean then? It's not good. Why would it not be good? Um, interesting thing, you know, when you talk about this illustration. God has existed eternally as one God in three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triune God. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Spirit eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. This triune God who has existed in perfect unity and perfect harmony and a perfect expression of love within himself makes man in his image. Well, well, that's not good. Well, as the son is eternally begotten of the father, the woman proceeds from the side of the man, which means that just as the son was always with the father, the woman was always with the man. And then proceeding from the union of the man and the woman, there are children, just as the spirit eternally proceeds from the father and the son. You have a triune picture of a triune God. Well, wait a minute. Does that mean that if somebody is not married and they don't have children, that they aren't part of that picture? No, because every human being is born as the completion of that triune picture. In the New Testament, we see that it's the picture of the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. So there's illustration. There's also sanctification, the third purpose of marriage. There's active sanctification, avoiding sexual immorality, enjoying God-honoring sexual relationships, washing with the water of the word, speaking the truth in love, so on and so forth. These active things that we do. But there's also that idea of passive sanctification, just the idea of learning to live with another imperfect sinner. That will sanctify you. All the married people in the house said, Amen. That will sanctify you. It will grow you up. People ask me all the time, hey, buddy, where'd you grow up? I grew up some in Los Angeles, but mostly when I got married. <laughs> it will grow you up. Like for real, it'll grow you up really fast. But before it grows you up, it exposes the fact that you're not. <laughs> Amen? It'll sanctify you. God will use marriage to chip away at you. Everything that's not like Jesus, he just chips away, he just chips away, he just chips away. And the great irony, of course, is those things that God does through marriage to chip away at us are the very things that we want to run away from. They're the very things that make us say, well, this, I must not have married the right one. Why? Because this is difficult and it's hard and it just shouldn't be this hard. Really? God using another sinner to sanctify you and chip away at you and expose the parts of you that are not like Christ 
and make them more like Christ shouldn't be hard? Help you if you believe that. That ought to be the hardest thing in the world. Amen? And the most glorious. Why? Because he's using it to make you like Jesus. I had a pastor ask me a question once. Bodie, when are you most like Jesus? When you're coasting along in your marriage and your wife is doing and being everything that you want her to do and be and satisfying your every need or when she's not and you have to lay down your life nonetheless? Which, which time were you more like Jesus? I don't want to answer your question. Why? Because it's a trick. <laughs> You're trying to make me rejoice in the difficulties in my marriage. I'm trying to feel sorry for myself. <laughs> I don't like you right now. <laughs> Procreation. Illustration. Sanctification. God also creates human sexuality. We see that God designed men and women, two sexes. God designed the union between men and women, and he made it obvious. Adam and Eve did not need instruction manuals. He made it obvious the way he designed us. And even if there was confusion, he designed the fruit of that union so that eventually you'd know when you got it right. Right? They didn't even have to. I wonder if we, I would, oh, yeah, that's, yep. <laughs> he also designed the parameters surrounding that union. God also established male headship. It's interesting. We think male headship was a byproduct of the fall. Uh, there are those who argue, for example, you know, it's, it's the curse. You know, it's, it's Genesis 3.16. You know, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. It's a byproduct of the fall. They also, by the way, use that to argue that because it's a byproduct of the fall, when we're redeemed in Christ, there should no longer be male headship because we're no longer fallen. Um, but male headship comes before the fall. Why? The woman was made after the man, male headship. The woman was made for the man. I will make him a helper suitable for him, male headship. The woman was made from the man, male headship. The woman was brought to the man, male headship. And the woman was named by the man, twice, male headship. You see, first he names her woman. He doesn't give her a specific name, by the way, Remember what I said? He's only naming categories of things. He gives her a categorical name, just like everything else that he was doing. Livestock, birds of the air, beast of the field. This, see, he gives her a categorical name. It's later on in chapter 3 that he gives her the name Eve. Listen to this from John Calvin. Moses now relates that marriage was divinely instituted, which is especially useful to be known. For since Adam did not take a wife to himself at his own will, but received her as offered and appropriated to him by God, the sanctity of marriage hence more clearly appears because we recognize God as its author. The more Satan has endeavored to dishonor marriage, the more should we vindicate it from all reproach and abuse that it may receive its due reverence. Then comes the fall. Let me do this quickly before we take a break. Okay. Chapter 3. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. By the way, categories, right? Serpent, any other beast of the field? Category. Very general categories here. Uh, 
again, this goes back to the idea of the naming of the animals. Adam didn't name millions and millions and millions of animals. He named probably hundreds of categories of animals. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Um, that's not what God said. That's, that's what God said with some stank on it, right? <laughs> I was adding some stuff. He's in it. He said, he said, we can eat from these other trees. We can't eat from that tree right there. In fact, we, we can't even touch that tree. Nah, that's not what he said. That's not what he said. May have been what she told herself. May have been what she convinced herself of. That tree's dangerous. I don't even want to go near it. I don't even want to touch it. But that's different than saying God said we, we can't even touch it. So the serpent has introduced doubt, perhaps even confusion. But the serpent said to the woman, first, hath God said? Right? And it sounds like a legitimate question. It sounds like he just, you know, Eve, I heard something. I heard that God said that y'all can't eat what you want. Is that true? This word starts. But he doesn't end there. He gets an answer, but he's not satisfied with the answer because this is not about curiosity. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. So now we go from has God said to God lied to you. And then we go from God lied to you to God's holding out on you. You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. God lied to you. God's holding out on you. God's keeping the best stuff for himself. It's nothing new. He tempts now like he tempted then. Is that really what the Bible says? Yeah, that is what the Bible says. You realize that's ridiculous, right? You realize that there's so much more out there for you to experience and enjoy, and that your Christianity is actually holding you back. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. What was the cause of the sin? 1 John 2.16. It's interesting. It's the same stuff. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. It's exactly what tempted Eve. She saw that the tree was good for food, a delight to the eyes, and that it was to be desired to make one wise, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Guilt and shame are introduced because of the sin. By the way, there's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt comes from within, from what you did. Shame comes from without how others see you. Now, guilt often leads to shame, but they're not the same thing. 
In fact, you can be made to feel shame without actually being guilty. There's a difference between the two, and we need to know the difference between the two. If you're dealing with shame and you're not guilty, then that means your problem is the fear of man. Your problem is what others are putting on you. This is what legalism often does. If you've got that problem, then you, 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 you need to deal with it externally, right? But more often, our shame is a byproduct of our guilt. We do something and we're guilty. And then we look around at other people and we're ashamed because we believe that they can see our guilt and that they're judging us for our guilt. And we project this onto them. There's a difference between guilt and shame, but they both are byproducts of the fall. There's another interesting question. Well, we won't deal with that one for the sake of time. So after the fall, what happens? Four things. Roles are reversed. Man is alienated from God. The offenders are cursed. And a redeemer is promised. And when we come back in the next session, we'll look at these four things that happened as a result of the fall. And after we've done that, to kind of tie this up, we'll also make a connection. And remember I told you that this is about the culture war, right? We're going to make the connection to how these realities are really the foundation upon which all of the major issues of our day and every other day have been built. And then if we have any more time um, tonight in the second session, we will deal with an application of this um, in the form of uh, the biggest uh, culture war that's going on today, this whole idea of sexuality and the way that we define sexuality. And um, we'll kind of see how that connects to all of this. Um, so we're going to take a break. We're going to take a 20-minute break, I believe, before we come back for the last session. Let me give you a, a couple of things before you go, okay? Um, there are resources out there, and you're free to go and peruse those resources and buy those resources, and I want you to buy those resources. Um, I, really, I do.